over the next uh, three weeks, or four if you include tonight, uh, we're going to be looking at um, an aspect that is very important to our world that sometimes we allow to be a little bit too important to us. Um, you know, <laughs> growing up in the church, I, I've seen we oftentimes go to one extreme because we think that the world is at a different extreme. Um, I'll give you a good example. You know, um, last year, cancel culture was real big. If you don't know what that is, it's basically where things were deemed offensive, and so they were, like, just basically discontinued. Um, different brands and companies, all kinds of different stuff. And the thing that made me laugh about all this actually had nothing to do with the cancel culture. It was how many, how many Christians... Um, we're so quick to say, you know, to, to to make fun of cancel culture, but I still remember like ten years ago, <laughs> we started it like we had this thing boycotting everything, right? So basically, if we deemed that it was offensive, not holy enough, supported the wrong causes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we would do our own little cancel culture, our own little boycott. We had to go to that extreme. We had to be super holy because the world was super sinful, right? So now the world is doing the exact same thing. Hey, this is offensive. Uh, and and then we're, oh now now we're making fun of them you know it seems like a lot of times um, unfortunately um, when we try and seek after God we think that it's all or nothing right it's it's it, we have to go to the extreme we have to find an extreme and go to it and that's normally not how things work but that brings up a very interesting question how do we interact with the world the world is preoccupied with a lot of different things and we live in the world so what does that mean for us like how how do we navigate this. And specifically, we're going to look at four areas um, in our lives that we have to manage. Okay, there is our world, the thing, you know, we live in the world, we're part of the world. Now, this list is actually compiled of what the world ranks as the most important to the least important. So taking care of the planet, they deem that the most important thing you can do. And Christians are seen more of as they should be a force for bringing about re recycling and green you know, a green world and that kind of stuff. Um, then there's bodies. You know, we have to be physically peak all the time. It, it, that's the most important thing in the whole, you know, well, besides keeping the world awesome. Our bodies is like second. And then third is our mental health, right? What's going on up here? And then lastly is, is spiritual health. I mean, that's not really that important. But the thing is, this list is actually completely reversed <laughs> from a biblical um Biblical role. I would say um, in, in Christianity, the spiritual health, our, our spiritual health is number one and everything else is number two. And yeah, I might be reading the Bible wrong, but that's kind of what it seems. So there's four areas of our lives that we have to manage, and the world has it in this order. Uh, our world, we have to, you know, make the world a better place, make it greener, recycle, that kind of stuff. That we have to our bodies, we have to exercise and eat healthy and that kind of stuff. Our minds, you know, take medicine or, or get counseling or whatever. And then our spirits, it's kind of like that's more of just your own personal preference. Um, and, and all of them are, are important to different degrees. But the consensus that our society has is completely backwards. And so that's kind of what I want to look at for the next couple of weeks, is how do we as Christians interact with this? How do we go to the problem in a way that can help us build bridges in the community? How do we go to the problem in a way that can help us bring people to God? Because, you know, if somebody really cares about something and you make fun of it, chances are you're going to miss your opportunity with them, right? That makes sense, right? Like if you establish yourself as this is what makes us us, you can't be us without this. And so a lot of people make that a political thing, right? So I'm, we are, I don't know, fill in the blank, Republican, Democrat, whatever. This is what we are here. You have to be like us. Okay. Uh, some If you guys have ever been to any of the richer places in California, I have. <laughs> and they have this very much of this mentality of, you know, where you're kind of like less than us. We've got money and you don't. You know, if you've ever been in that kind of situation, you know how awkward it gets because you know that they're looking down on you because, well, you're not rich. And uh, kind of like you don't belong here. That's like the thing that the thing that you have to have to fit in is the money. And uh, so as, a, as Christians, as a church, wh what is our thing? What is our thing that we're saying, this is what you have to have to be us? Now, hopefully, that would be Jesus only. But unfortunately, we, we all get our own little things that we see as really important. Some people, for instance, got really worked up over the voting situation in 2020. 
Some people didn't. Uh, some people got really worked up about what's happening in the economy right now. Some people didn't. So we kind of see in the world that spiritual health things are kind of deemed as just not really that important. Whatever you want to believe, that's fine. Prayer is, it's cute, it's fine, whatever. It's more of just a, a, like something that makes you feel better. Like, oh, I prayed for you today. Oh, okay, you know that. So you were thinking of me. You were sending positive vibes, basically, is the, is the, is the idea that people get from that. And it's like, well, no, no, vibes don't do anything. I'm praying, so hope, you know, for God to interact in this situation, that's completely different than positive vibes. And uh, so let's, let's look at some of these extremes. The first extreme I want to look at is save the planet. Um, you know, people go to this thing, you know, they get so consumed about it. our world. We're being overpopulated. We don't have enough food for the, and they just, they just, it consumes them. They just completely shake into fear with this. We got to We got to start managing better and saving the planet. I'm definitely not saying that, you know, it's bad. It, it, it's, it's not good to, you know, think ahead about the future. But the problem is that I've seen in the church, we go to the other extreme. Well, it's all going to burn in the end anyways. I don't have to take care of the planet. Let it burn. And I think that, once again, there is a middle ground. I'm going to say this in two ways. Number one, Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Roll over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So there's... There's a lot of different things that being made in the image of God means. But one of the things that it means, especially as it applies to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the, of the Bible, is it means to act in the place of God. To be made in, man, in God's image means that we are literally placed here to carry out his will in the world. Now, I'm not saying that's the only meaning of that verse, but that is, as it applies to the first five books of the Bible, that's one of the main things. We are responsible for how we act in this world. We're meant to show God, not, you know, the other way around. And so then when people didn't do that, throughout the book of Genesis, for instance, we see a lot of bad things happening. And that leads me to my second point. We are meant to be good stewards with the things that God has given us. And so do we have to be a crazy person who, like, starts yelling at people that they need to recycle and, you know, we can only buy, you know, these electric cars and all these different... No, that's... No. <laughs> no, no, no. But we do have to realize that there are people who really see this as the most important thing in the world. Think about it. Take God out of your life. I'm preserving the world for the next generation. See what I mean? It makes sense if you don't have God in your life. Now... Once again, we go to the other extreme. Well, they're going to the extreme of saving the planet, so we've got to watch it burn. Let's burn plastic in our yards, and ha-ha-ha, I'll never recycle. You can make me die first. And you might say, well, what does this have anything to do with Christianity or the church? Why are we even talking about this kind of stuff? I promise you it'll make sense. A little bit at the end of this, this lesson, but then especially at the end of the four weeks. Just hold on for a couple of weeks and, and, and listen, okay? So the planet will wear out. That's just something that's going to happen. It's, it's, it's going to wear out. Um, our bodies will wear out, our vehicles, our money. But here's the thing. All those things that I just mentioned, the planet, our bodies, our vehicles, money, all that stuff, all of it will wear out. But we are still expected by God to manage it wisely. See, I think the way we treat the world reveals something that's in our heart a little bit of foolishness where God has said, hey, be a steward. And we've said, no. So then the world says it's the most important thing that we can do is the planet. And then we just say, ah, whatever. And we're missing out, I think, on a on a on an opportunity to reach people. And I guess what I'm trying to say is just because something isn't eternal doesn't mean we should be wasteful of it. God has given you money. He expects you to be wise with that money. God has given you time on this planet. He expects you to be wise with how you spend your time. If you waste your whole life watching Netflix, I'm pretty sure that's not exactly what God had in mind for your life. But the plan is saving the planet. That's not that's not the heart of the existence of Christianity. That's not what it's all about. 
Like I said at the beginning, there's some people who think that the church is nothing more than a club whose purpose should be the making the world a better place. It has nothing to do with God or that kind of stuff. And obviously, that doesn't really say much about Jesus. Money is another thing that's 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 a, a part of our world, right? So we, we talked about saving the planet. Money is another thing. And, and what does that make you think of the economy? Everybody's upset right now because of the economy. I understand. It, it seems like a very scary situation. Oh, God won't let the economy collapse, will he? It's happened in other countries. <laughs> like, that's something that happens in the world. So, no, there is no promise that, you know, your money will be worth anything tomorrow. That's always a factor of life. But the difference being that we don't have to worry about it like the world does. Okay? So, sometimes people die, and sometimes God leads us into situations that are less than ideal. It's scary, <laughs> but he's still in control. There's a difference between being scared and God not being in control. God sometimes, oftentimes, will bring you into a scary situation. That doesn't mean that he brought you into a situation he's not in control of. So money is another part that people get really upset with. The economy is in despair, so people kind of go to pieces. Let's look at, let's kind of bring some balance here. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to go that. I, I totally, totally skipped my mind. Just because it isn't eternal doesn't mean we should waste it. That applies to everything that we're talking about tonight. So that's kind of a, kind of a big idea there. Now listen, you rich people, weep and well because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and moss have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. Money isn't the most important thing. I've known many Christians who think that managing money is more important than anything. I mean, every time I was around them, they just said, money, 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 money. There, there's, there's more to it than that. But we also see that God expects us to be wise with how we handle money. We, we, show, we see that God gives us, once again, time and time again of giving us advice of, this is how you should spend your money. If you read through Proverbs, like half of that is about finances. This is kind of an important thing. It, it, it has a big impact on life. We're actually going to look at Proverbs 16, 8, which says, Better a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. See, having all the things, it, it, it's not what it's all about. And God sometimes brings us into places of not having what we deem as enough. He oftentimes does that. He brings us through scary situations and that kind of stuff. It, it's definitely something that happens in this world. But thankfully, our hope doesn't have to be set on money. If the economy collapses, yeah, scary. That's not where our hope is anyways, though. Our hope is on something bigger, something better. It's on God. Matthew 6.34 says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow, tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So the one thing that I want to point out here, I'll go back as I say this, is that with God, it God cares more for our character than the specific thing. Does that kind of make sense? He, he cares more for, well, like this, this verse, for instance, shows righteousness than great riches. But God, look how much money I was able to raise I used it for good purposes, yes, but you, you, you weren't right in here, see? And um, so this is another area that the world kind of gets a little bit off on here. And so I, when, when situations like this come up, where our world is definitely in a chaotic situation, it becomes hopeless because your entire purpose is to save the planet, to right every wrong. Well, what do you do in a situation like this when you can't? Go ahead and rant all you want on Facebook. You're not going to help Russia and Ukraine be be homies right now. Like it's just, it's not your your Facebook rant isn't going to do anything about that. You can have as many YouTube videos as you want. <laughs> You're not going to solve some problems overnight. So bad things could bad things could always happen. We could die, but worrying won't change any of that. All that worrying does is it robs your joy. See, but our, the world around us is consumed with this stuff, so it's trying to. Pull our attention to it. So that's my first point of the night, is that we live in the world. And the world has its own things that it cares about. And if we're not careful and pay attention, their cares will become our cares. Their worries will become our worries. Save the planets. Ah! It's like, okay, all right. I, I totally hear what you're saying. 
clean clean up your clean up you don't throw your throw your trash in the yard you clean up after yourself i get that you know don't be wasteful with stuff i get all this okay that doesn't mean you have to go to the place of fear money hey yeah good idea to handle it well but when you worry about something all the time all it does is it rob your robs your joy it doesn't change the situation well i'm thinking about this and about this and about this my my rule of thumb has now become this I only think about a problem so long as I am currently in the process of dealing with it. If there's nothing that I can do right now to deal with that problem, I, I go to something else. Why? Because if you sit there and spin your tires and think about something that's irritating you, it's just going to irritate you all the more. You're going to rob yourself of joy. So God will provide for what he calls us to, but of course you shouldn't be stupid with what he has given you. Like walking in traffic, for instance. So managing, managing money is, is another thing that's important and is a part of our world. It's something that the world is very consumed with. But there's much more to life than managing money, right? I mean, let's look at Luke 12, 15. It says, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. What if the economy collapses? Life does not it, it, the purpose of life is not about the abundance of possessions. If the economy collapses, it collapses. There's nothing you can do, and worrying about it isn't going to change anything anyways. See, a lot of times we allow what the world is concerned about to be our panic attack, rather than going to Scripture, rather than going to the Bible and finding our comfort and our peace for the situation there. So the world is all upset about this or that or the other thing. Trust me, if you read the news, you're going to find something else this week to be to be upset about. They're going to, or they're going to take something that you're already scared about, like World War III or something, and they're going to blow it out of out of proportion, and then you're going to get even more scared about it. It's they're just looking for something else to scare you with. Another thing that people get really off on: save the animals, right? They make their whole life about saving the animals. Now, I I understand love of animals. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I have pets. I I, I love animals myself. Not to the degree that, let's say, for instance, PETA does. Uh, but, you know, I do definitely like animals. I'm glad God created them. But there's something to kind of keep in mind here. I mean, Proverbs 12.10 uses what's called an extreme example. And what that means is it might seem like he's talking about how it is a righteous thing to take care of the animals. That's not his point at all. It's an extreme example. What he does how an how extreme example works is is you know what it, it, rather than explaining that i could just explain this and it would explain what an extreme example is the righteous person somebody who who fears god they even take care of their animals i mean they they fear god even their animals the lowest thing in their household is taken care of but the kindness the best that a wicked person has to has to offer is cruel that it's an extreme example. When somebody follows and fears God, the very smallest thing in their household, the very smallest thing that God has entrusted them to, they take care of. But with a fool, with a wicked person, it doesn't matter what they have. It's it, the the very best that they can do is still cruelty. It's it's that the point isn't really about animals. It's saying the wise even take care of animals. It's important, but once again, our lives are more than saving animals. They're more than saving animals. You know, if it's some, if it's something you have a passion for, you 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 maybe work for something that saves animals. Those are all fine or whatever. I'm not saying anything against that. But once again, these are things that it's not what our lives are about. Just like money, some people think it's all about money. Some people think it's all about saving the planet. This isn't what it's all about. Another another example that people really get get bent up about is is leaders, right? You got evil leaders and dictators, and, and so what we in America have done is we've kind of circumnavigated what the Bible has said about about authority and about leaders and about all that. And when instead we say, well, we have to speak out. So what that does is it says, I have this rebellious attitude, but it's for the greater good that I have this rebellious attitude, therefore it's okay. And it's like, well, I, I don't think that historical Christianity would agree with that. I mean, you have, for instance, Paul. Emperors were very, very wicked. Let me just say that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go read a history book. And, you know, really not great, <laughs> not, not, not great people. And Paul still said, hey, you know, well, I'm going to look at, look at some of the things that he said. And uh, then those same emperors were the guys that killed him. So kind of important. 
but in America, we've kind of adopted, adopted this attitude that we can kind of live in rebellion and just kind of kind of have this bad attitude. If you don't believe me, see what happens when somebody says Biden. Instantly, something enters your brain, right? You're just like, oh, I had this. Or, you know, maybe maybe you're okay with Biden. Trump. That's all you have to say. And instantly there's these negative feelings and people, ah, you started, you've started a controversial fight. And it's like, well, that's kind of what I'm talking about. Oh, he's an idiot or they're an idiot. Or you, they're, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you could probably save the world single-handedly if it was you. But in the meantime, God has given us a directive of how to, how to treat authority and, and leaders and those kinds of things. And I understand, I understand that we vote for presidents. I, I get that. But to have an attitude like this, he's not my president. Well, let me just kind of explain a few things to you. First off, yes, if you're an American citizen, he is, in fact, your president. <laughs> Maybe you don't like the president. That's, that's all another issue. But he is still your president. That's how it works to be a citizen. And then the second thing about that is, um, well, you know, having that kind of attitude of, oh, is it most important that the person that you like is in office when you know that they're only going to be there for a few years and God's kingdom is eternal? Like, let's put things in perspective here. I, I understand it's important to vote. I am not saying don't vote. I understand all these things. Just like I said, hey, hey, yeah, take care of the planet. You know, be wise with your money. But the world is upset with these things. The world is consumed with these things. The planet, the money, the leaders. That's not how it should be with us. I mean, think about one of the things that Jesus said. This world is consumed with, with trying to get a position, but it's not going to be like that for you. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you have to make yourself little. That's totally backwards, and that's kind of what my point is. This world has this way of, this is how it should be done, and how do we interact with that? Well, the first thing is, like I've said, don't let the world define what is of value to you. We live in it. That doesn't mean we have to agree with it on everything. And I'll get to my second main point in just a minute. So let's look at what some of the things that the Bible says about this. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, which are the people, by the way, who, who killed Jesus, okay, uh, sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. You have to respect their authority, even though they are off track. Ah, this is Jesus' opinion of authority. Submit yourself to it and respect it, even though they're off track. We could, we could reword this if you wanted to. Um, the politicians sit in the leadership seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. We are not a, a, a what's it called, a rebellion. The church is not a rebellion. The church <laughs> is the kingdom of God. What, what we're about is about Christ and him crucified. It's about us being less and him being more. And we can't possibly be less and him more when we take him down and say, no, it's about who I voted for and who I didn't vote for. What's most important? Just honestly, be real with yourself and say, hey, what's really the most important thing? And if you look at all the things in the world that are going on right now and, and the things that really concern you, just stop and say, is this as important as I'm making it out to be? And you'll find most of the time it's not. Most of the time. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Okay. Straight from his mouth. And Paul has something to say here, too. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for people. Thanksgiving was one of the things on that list. You hear people say, pray for your leaders. You never hear people say, be thankful for your leaders. That takes it to a whole nother level. I'm going to be honest. There's been some leaders that I haven't been too fond of. Definitely not real thankful about. And I'm sure you have some on your own list too. For kings and all those in authority. Well, we don't have kings. We have people in authority though. But I vo we voted for them. That's different. It's not different. It's not different. Like, stop trying to excuse a bad attitude. That we may live peacefully and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. What part of ranting about a politician is a peaceful and quiet life in godliness and holiness? You go ahead and compile a list, and I'll wait. 
and then we'll see if it's okay to have the nasty attitudes that we've been spreading. I tell you what, I was real. Oh boy, I had to just stop talking and leave the room. Um, there was a certain person. Um, it was the governor. There was it was the governor, and I was not very happy about a lot of the things that she was doing. And so I, every time I there was a chance for me to say something bad against her, I took it. I took it with vengeance, and I loved it, every minute of it. And it felt so good to talk about how stupid she was. Probably not the best course of action there, would you agree? So, um, I'll give you a couple, of, a couple uh, examples. There was a pastor, his name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, or if you'd like to say with a, with a German accent, I'm not going to, but you are welcome to, um, who lived in Germany during World War II. And he actually got out as the Nazi party was rising to power, but he felt like that wasn't where he was supposed to be. So he went back and um, he tried to do what he could. And one of the things that he thought he was should do is speak out against not Nazism, not Nazism, Nazis against the Nazis. Uh, and uh, obviously what you can imagine happened, happened. Adolf Hitler killed him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Hello. <laughs> That's kind of what happens in those kinds of situations. Um, but he he did what he felt he should have done, and it cost him his life. Another example, maybe a lot more ancient than that, is John the Baptist. Um, he was uh, speaking against a, a leader's immoral practice. And when I say he was speaking against, I don't mean he was going around stirring up dissension. He wasn't going to the different Jews and to the different Gentiles and saying, this guy's a slime bag. No, he went to the person and he said, you have your brother's wife. That's not good. And then, well, the guy got a little mad, <laughs> so he arrested him. <laughs> That's different than, than stirring up dissension. Stirring up dissension is where you can't say something good about somebody. You just go around starting fights. You start quarrels. You're trying to get people worked up about something. That Biden, let me tell you what stupid thing he did this week. Kind of like that. That's just, that's just being a divisive person. You're causing problems. Besides that, if there's somebody who's a who's a very big Biden supporter, they're not going to listen to anything you have to say about Jesus because the political atmosphere is very heated right now. It's like you really have to pick your battles. And anyways, uh, and so then he was later killed. So I guess what I'm saying here is, you know, let, let's let's break this down into a few things. First off, stand for what is right. I'm not saying to be spineless. Stand for what is right. Is it right that we keep meeting as a church? Yes. Not, not, not in rebellion, not because of, you know, anything that a leader says or doesn't say, because that's what the churches should be doing. That's, that's what we should be doing. Um, if the building ends up closing again, we'll probably do some kind of, I would imagine, if there is some, I don't think that we would close down the building. But if it ever came to that again, we would probably go to like a house kind of situation or something. I mean, we wouldn't just stop meeting. And that's assuming that they came and put chains on the doors. My moral of the story being, I don't think we're going back that way. That's just, we have to stand for what is right. But criticizing the governor and calling her stupid is not standing for what is right. See the difference? Okay, let's let's give some more examples here. Um, standing up for what is right. Okay. Uh, there are some people who are going to go and riot at uh, a government building. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I don't know, you know, if what this news says is true or not. I don't care. I'm not going to do that. See what I mean? Standing up for what is right, but then not doing something wrong. And the problem is with a lot of this is we all have our minds made up on different things. And so it's hard to critically analyze what we believe because we already know what we want to believe and we don't really want our, to change our mind. So, yes, yeah, stand for what is right, but do it with a good heart. And remember that there are consequences for standing up for what is right. So make sure that you're picking the right fight. The right. The right fight. And, uh, you know, life is more than politics, just like it's more than money, just like it's more than, than saving the planet. And I just want to say one more time before we move on from this, stirring up complaints and gossip against leaders isn't the same as standing up for what is right. That's called being a divisive person. For too long, the church has said it's okay for us to go around and, 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 and you know, stir up bad feelings about this person because they're a Democrat or because they're this or that or the other thing. And it's okay because our rebellion is justified. That's not really found in the Bible. So, you know, that's one of those things that 
you know, it's it's not the same being a argumentative and divisive person as standing up for what's right. Okay. Um, so I don't believe that the church should shut down again. I thought at the time that it was the right thing to do because we were trying to be a good influence in our community. We were, we were trying to, you know, follow the law of the land and everything. We were trying to do what's right. But at the end of the day, it just kept getting extended and moved on and on and on and on. And we thought that we were willing to do the six-week thing, but the whole two-year thing shutting down, we weren't even about that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I hope that, that kind of you kind of see what I'm saying there. The problem with talking about, about authority is because people with authority problems are always going to misinterpret everything you say and say, oh, you're disrespectful to authority. But people who don't have a problem with authority, they're not the ones who really need to hear it, so they won't say a bunch of snide comments about how you're disrespectful to authority. So it's kind of hard. Uh, but there's bigger things than, than politics. John the Baptist wasn't ranting against leaders. He wasn't stirring a rebellion. He wasn't gossiping. He wasn't worrying. Are you worrying? about the political situation? Are you gossiping about the political situation? Are you stirring up rebellion against the political situation? Do you see the difference? So some people reduce the gospel to a social gospel. I already said about how some people make it about the church is nothing more than a force to work positive change in the world. Well, some people see it as more of a social issue. The only point of Christianity is to bring a positive impact in their community. That's it. The church exists for no other reason than to feed people who don't have food, basically, than to clothe people who don't have clothes. That's it. That's as far as a mission goes. But the problem with that kind of mindset is, 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 is twofold. First off, you can't right every wrong. You can spend your whole life trying to right every single wrong, and the world will still find more things to go wrong. Why? Because this world is not a utopia. And the second thing is, Christianity isn't to make isn't to make people better. What? Yes, Christianity is not to make people better. I talk to people all the time. Drug addicts get get off on this a lot. Well, I'm doing good. I'm not on drugs anymore, so I don't therefore I don't need to go to church. You, hold on, you assume that church is only has a value of getting off of drugs or being a good person. So you have deemed that you're a good enough person. Therefore, you don't need the church. Christianity is an amount about making people good people. That's where the issue is. <laughs> it, <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's about trusting God and obeying him. That's what Christianity is about. Some of us seem to have our act together. Some of us seem like total screw-ups. That's the way of it. <laughs> Christianity isn't about making people better. Obeying God, though, it goes beyond just simply trusting God and obeying Him. Part of obeying God is going to church. Part of trusting God is loving your enemies. Obeying God is largely loving people. Here, I'll give you a good example of this whole social gospel thing. Is, are we a food pantry with a church or a church with a food pantry? Think about it. Now, now think about it. If we are a food pantry with a church, then everything bends around the food pantry. If we are a church with a food pantry, then the food pantry is established for a purpose. Okay, so what's the purpose of the food pantry? To build bridges in the community and to bring people to God. We have an ulterior motive, you could say. Everything that we do in this church has the same driving force behind it. It's on the wall back there. To bring people to God, to build bridges in the community. That's what everything we do here is about. We have a young adults group. That's the purpose. We have a, we have a food pantry. That's the purpose. That's what it's all about. It's not just about the food. Yes, yes, we, we want to help people. Yes. I'm not saying anything against that. But we are a church with a food pantry, not vice versa. We exist, this church exists to build bridges in the community and to bring people to God. Food, food pantry is a way to do that. And so we have things that come up like, for instance, save the planet. Everything's about money. Save the animals. There's evil leaders in the world. All these different things that come up. And I'm not saying that, that they're not important. Just like I'm not saying that it's not important to give people to give somebody who doesn't have clothes clothes. I'm, I'm not saying those things aren't important. But there is a bigger issue, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. We exist to build bridges in the community and bring people to God. So does the church work social good? Yes. Yes. 
We hosted a Santa in the Basin thing here. I think it went great. The year before that, we had uh, our young, actually consecutively for three or four years before that, we uh, gave out Christmas boxes to the young adults group, gave out Christmas boxes. We do the food pantry. We uh, have oftentimes given people, well, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, we have oftentimes done things that, you know, uh, to help people, to help the community. We, we've, our, our young adult group has done cleanups in, in the area, cleaning up trash and that kind of stuff. I'm not saying those kinds of things aren't important. Social good, yes. But purpose, the purpose isn't to try and make the world a better place. The purpose is to love God and to love people. We serve in the food pantry. We serve in these different things as an expression of loving God and loving people. It's an expression of our faith. The people who, who volunteer for food pantry, they don't, they don't get anything out of it. It is simply a, an expression of their faith in God. I'm reminded of the story of the Good Samaritan, where there was this guy that's beat up, if you don't know the story, and these different people walk by and don't do anything to help him. There's you know this, this Levite and this priest, these people that should have, should have been able to help, and they didn't. And instead, the Samaritan, who the Jews despised, comes by and he sees him and he helps him. Is, this, is, the, is Christianity a social gospel? No, but it has social implications. We are very much so live in the world. It was bad for those people who could have helped to withhold the good. It was bad for them to withhold the good, and I think that that kind of clarifies what the church is about. So with that being said, we can go to the second thing that I really want to get out of tonight. There's a movie called Lord of the Rings, and in it there's these tree monster things. They're called Ents. It's not really important. And uh, they say this part in the movie. It's not in the book, but it is in the movie. And, they, and th these, these people are trying to get them to help out in this fight. And there's this huge army that they're trying to get them to help out with. And, and they say this. They say, this isn't, this isn't our war. But then the people who are trying to you know, recruit them into this battle say, but you're a part of the world. You can't just hide from it. So that brings me to the second thing that I'm kind of trying to, um, the main point, the same main point. So we, we live in the world, but don't let the world govern what's right and wrong. And then the second thing is, as you're living in the world, remember that everyone has something that it's important to them. Everyone. Do you care more for them or for your own agenda? Do you care more for them or for your own interests? You, we all have things that, that we are concerned about. Some of us are more, more financially minded. Some of us are more politically minded, whatever. We all have that thing, but are we willing to let that thing go for them and to help us connect with them? See, our hope is far beyond our ability to make this world a better place. It is an opportunity for us to show love to those around us. The problems that we have around us, they are opportunities. So the second point that I'm trying to get at is the world is consumed with these different things, and that is how you build a bridge into somebody's life. These are the things that they're concerned about. How can you use it as an opportunity to connect with them and point them to Christ? Don't get sucked in. That was the first point. Don't get sucked into what the world sees as most important. The second point, use it as an opportunity. It is an opportunity for us to show love to those around us, how we interact in these situations. Especially since this is often their biggest concern. Their biggest concern is going to be World War III. Are, are we going into World War III? Is the economy going to collapse? Is, is, is. That's their biggest concern. So knowing that, Instead of ridiculing it, how can we make that work for an opportunity to, for the gospel? See, the problem is we get too caught up in the, in the extremes, right? I've got to either disagree with you and prove you wrong. I've got to, you know, oh, you're stupid for worrying about that. You know, we, get, we have to do the extreme thing. We can't just say, okay, this is important to you. Let's see how I can point this to Christ. Though it is temporary in passing... Problems in our world test our character. These problems that come by, they, they test our character. People are all, all upset about uh, 
who's president? Are you going to hop on the, on the train and 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 ha use that opportunity to really talk about how stupid that person is, or are you going to see it as an opportunity to connect with somebody? See, it's easy to say this church exists to bring people to God and to build bridges in the community. It gets a lot harder when there's issues going on, like the issues going on in the world. Then you have to say, well, how do we do that? We can show Christ's love in these temporary and passing troubles that we're facing. And these, these problems, they help us connect to others. So, so the three things that I mentioned, the, the problems test our character, they, show, they allow us to show Christ's love, and they help us to connect to others. And so what I think I would say in all of this is that the world is overly consumed with making the world a better place. It's scary to not know what's next. And even as, as Christians sometimes get a little bit shaken about what's next, our health starts to go wrong or something like that, we get a little bit concerned. How much more if you don't have the hope of Christ? So with that being said, you know, this is the most important issue of the world. Maybe we don't have to ridicule it and try to make ourselves out to be bumpkins who just burn plastic. Maybe we can use it as an opportunity to reach out to people, right? You get what I'm saying? You're picking up what I'm putting down? Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity that you've given us and, you know, the different things that are going on in the world and in the news. Help us to be wise with the time that we have and to be good stewards with what we have. That we would have opportunity to show people you. Lord, that we wouldn't be so caught up in trying to prove a point that we'd show ourselves to be stupid. Lord, give us the wisdom to see the bigger issues. Lord, that we would remember we are in the world, not of the world. Lord, give us the wisdom to seize the opportunities. We love you, Lord. Amen.